right. Um, so to help you um, pay attention during this next talk, um, I'm giving away a couple copies of my book, Designing Voice User Interfaces. Um, at the end of the talk, I will ask a couple of trivia questions about <laughs> something I said during the talk. So you got to stay awake. <laughs> All right. Let's start off with uh -oh, my clicker. Sorry. I'm going to get my dongle. Let's start off with a little m movie clip, short clip. Does your dig that? Oh. oh. <laughs> Let's dig it. <laughs> I thought you said your dig did not bite. That is not my talk. So this is Return of the Pink Panther. Anyone here seen this movie? It's from the 70s. Um, so what makes this funny? What makes this funny is something called the cooperative principle. Uh, so back in the 1970s, there was a language philosopher named Paul Grice, and he came up with these principles to explain how it is that we humans manage to have successful conversations. And the basis of this is that most of the time when we're talking to somebody, we want to succeed. I want to use words that are going to make sense to you. You're going to be an active listener. I'm going to try not to go on too long. And he came up with these different maxims, relevance, quantity, quality, and manner. And so in this movie clip, the hotel clerk is breaking the maxim of relevance. Clearly, Inspector Clouseau is talking about the dog in front of them. But this hotel clerk is talking about a dog that nobody else knows about and is not even in the room. And the reason I bring up the cooperative principle is because it's a really good way when you're working on conversational systems to think about why sometimes people might be having a frustrating experience where your design is not going well, because if you are breaking the cooperative principle in your design, you will also end up in situations like this. So what is conversation design anyway? Essentially at its core, it's about getting computers to be able to communicate more like humans and not the other way around. I mean, we've been speaking for something like 150,000 years. Computers, a little bit less longer than that. Um, so really, we need to think about the best way to create these products to make them really simple and easy and smooth. Now, I've been in this business <clears throat> a long time, and over the years, we often hear the same thing. Why should I hire a conversation designer? I know how to have conversations. I've been having them since I was a little kid. Why do I need to buy, you know, pay for some specialist to do this? And again, it goes back to we've all been talking for a long time, but how many of us understand sort of like the rules of conversation? you know, when you're talking to other people. And also, you may be able to design a lovely conversation, but can you make it work within the technical constraints of the systems that we're using today? So thinking about something simple. Let's say I asked you to go create a chat bot, and all it's, I want it to do is to be able to let people order lunch. So you go off and you make your design and you bring it back to me. And the way that we um, often mock up our designs in conversation design is with something called a sample dialogue. It's kind of like a back and forth, like a movie script, potential conversation between your user and the system. So you go off and you come back with this great sample dialogue and we run through it. And the order bot says, how can I help you? I'd like a tuna salad. What kind of dressing? Honey lemon, be $11. How would you like to pay? Blah, blah, blah. Seems pretty straightforward. This is a closed domain, right? All we're doing is letting the person order a salad or a sandwich or whatever. So it seems pretty, pretty easy. But the reason I bring up this example is because I was ordering a tuna salad a while ago um, at a cafe not that far from here. And I realized it was actually kind of complicated. And I went down and went back and wrote down the conversation as it happened. And it looked more like this. So I went in, cashier said, how can I help you? I started off, can I please have the tuna salad? But there's like three different parts to this order, like do you want croutons, you know, et cetera. And so I was watching him and waiting for him to press the button to let me know like, oh, he's ready to hear more from me. Because if I just blurted out my whole order, it's too much information. He might miss some of it. So I wait and then I say with croutons, because I don't want the bread, I want the croutons. And then I have a problem, which is I go to two different cafes to get tuna salad and they have two different lemon dressings, and I can't remember which dressing is at this cafe. So I indicate that with my voice. I say, and the lemon herb dressing or whatever? And he understands what I mean, but he doesn't say anything. He doesn't even look at me. 
He just kind of nods, and so I know he's gotten it. And then I finish off with to go. So now he turns to me and says, that'll be $11. And then he throws out another question, unless there'll be anything else. And I just hand over my credit card. So you can see here, <laughs> the way we communicate is so much more than just the individual words. And when you're working with a voice assistant or a chatbot, that's all you have, the words. But here we see pausing is important, intonation, body language, eye gaze. Computer doesn't have any of those things yet. They also just don't have any common sense. This is one of my favorite examples. This is a guy named Paul the trombonist. He was um, texting with his wife, using his voice, and he went off to practice the trombone. <laughs> and the voice assistant just kept doing its best to keep transcribing that conversation. Woo, 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 hoo, 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 ha, ha. I love how it has all these different words, right? It's pretty awesome. Um, but, you know, a human would never do this. A human would be like, oh, that's not for me. He's playing the trombone and go off and get on with our day. But a computer, not so much. Um, also, language has a lot of ambiguity. So if you ask me, do you want coffee? And I say, coffee will keep me awake. How many people here think, yes, I want coffee? <laughs> How many people here think, no, I do not want coffee? <laughs> It's either, right? It depends on the context. If it's in the morning and I got a big day ahead of me, probably a yes. If it's right before bed, it's probably a no. And this, again, is something that's real hard for computers to do. I mentioned pausing in that tuna salad example. Pauses contain a lot of information. So if I, I ask you, can I get a ride tomorrow? And you don't say anything for a full second, which is not that long, I know something's probably, probably up. You don't want to give me a ride. So. <laughs> I will probably take another conversational turn, even though it's really your turn, and say, oh, you're, you're probably too busy. How about Friday? When we're having conversations, it's usually 200 milliseconds between each turn. It's the blink of an eye. And again, this is something our computers haven't quite caught up with. But it's important information. Even answering yes or no, we answer no ever so slightly more slowly than we do the word yes. Another thing I want to talk about is the difference between, one of the differences between designing conversations and something like a website is that often with websites, we are designing the structure first. So we might do the layout and the color scheme and the header format, all these different things, and we fill it in with these, you know, filler Latin words. But with conversation design, the words are the structure. So we can't do it that way. We have to be thinking about that from the beginning. And I'll give you a specific example. Um, one of my coworkers at Google, Jared, was working on, he was in charge of having the Google Assistant answer questions about when businesses were open, what hours they were open. Now, if you have a visual um, display, like if you're using the Google Assistant on your phone, you can just throw up a table, right? And no matter what question they're asking about the business hours, the user has to do the mental work of looking at the times, figuring out is open for lunch, is open on Friday, and they can get all their questions answered themselves. But what about a voice-only situation? So if you're using a smart speaker, he realized that there's a lot of different ways that people might be asking for information. And we should actually answer these questions differently depending on what was asked. So for example, if I say, is Sushi Ku open? That is a yes, no question. The first thing that we should say is either yes or no. That's what they're looking for. But if they say, what time is it open? That's not a yes, no question. So he determined there were something like 66 different ways, different structures, in order to answer all these questions correctly. Because the worst thing to do would have been like, what time is Sushi Ku open? Well, on Fridays it's open from 5 to 10 p.m. And on Saturdays it's open from 11 a.m. to 11 to 12 p.m. I mean, that would just be horrible. So he had to do a lot of work up front because, of course, this is going to impact the structure, the code. You have to do this at the beginning. You can't just throw it in at the end. If you only remember one thing from my entire talk, this is it. This is the slide. Design for how people actually talk, not how you want them to talk. This is something that I see all the time. We as designers and developers, we have a mental model of how our conversation should take place. What's going to happen? We know the answers to the questions. And we think, oh, if we just craft the prompt to be super clear and ask just the right thing, People will say, just the thing we want, we'll be able to answer it, and we'll move on. But that's just not reality, because humans. I mean, we talk in such a huge variety, variety of ways. Everything from vocabulary to style to even flow. So even something like ordering a pizza. I might order a pizza differently than you. I might call up a pizza place and say, I'd like three large mushroom pizzas to go um, you know, tonight. Whereas someone else might call and say, hey, how you doing? 
I want to order a pizza. Which causes the other person to have to say, OK, how many? What toppings? These are both totally legit ways to order pizza, right? But sometimes voice designers and developers kind of forget that, and they want to squeeze people into one very specific flow. Um, even simple things, like let's say you're trying to do a restaurant booking application, and you might ask somebody, well, how many people are in your party? And you've decided that they're going to say a number between 1 and 20. And then somebody says, uh, well, do you have any high chairs? That is a completely legitimate question. And yet, most systems will probably say, sorry, I didn't understand. Give me a number between 1 and 20. But you have to think about how humans are going to approach this. And you do this a variety of ways, user research, of course, running uh, usability studies, running pilots, and just following design best practices. So just briefly, a little bit about where is this technology going? For starters, this is actually the present, not the future, but there's a trash can from Simple Human, uh, costs $250, and it responds to the command, open can. And then it opens, and then you can throw your trash in there. Um, how do we feel about this? It's, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it, is this the world we want to live in, where you're going to be talking to things all, you know, wherever you are, you're just going to be saying, open can, and order milk, and, uh, you know, feed the dog, or whatever, and things are going to happen. I don't know. We, we'll have to wait and see what happens. Um, what about the idea of a virtual assistant that becomes your lifelong companion? What if it gets to know you when you're very young and it gets to know your favorite colors and your moods and at the end of the day you can go to your virtual assistant and you can complain about your coworkers and it will say, oh, what a hard day you've had and it'll never say like, well, you didn't do the dishes or what about my day? Um, <laughs> But, you know, what's the kind of the downside to that? Like, what if it makes you so averse to talking to other people that I'm like, oh, I'm mad at my best friend. I'm going to tell my virtual assistant to tell her virtual assistant that I'm mad at her because, you know, you're, like, afraid of, of speaking to humans. Um, and this picture, by the way, is from the San Jose airport. Um, they have these robot babysitters. They don't babysit robots. They're supposed to babysit kids, I guess. But they always have a human in there. But the kids are always playing with a human and not the, not the robots. So to finish up, I want to show this little video. So one of the issues we have with voice recognition or voice assistance today is that many of us might be comfortable talking to them um, at home in our house. But when we're out and about, like when I was on BART, I didn't want to pull out my phone and start talking to it, um, even though it would have been very convenient. So there are some companies and institutions working on something called silent speech or subvocalization. Basically, as you start to form words, it's capturing these pre-speech signals and translating those um, before you actually utter the sounds. So this is a short clip from MIT Media Lab about a prototype they've, they've been working on. Ten forty three AM. Total ten dollars and seven cents. conversation design, um, you can get my book. You can get this other book. You have the author in the front row, Voice First Development, help you build the actual systems. Um, and then Google has also published some best practices at actions.google.com slash design. And I also have some cards with that, that URL on it. Um, thank you very much. <laughs> All right, so we'll do a quick, quick giveaway. So uh, first trivia question. Um, sorry, I can't necessarily see in the back that well. but. Uh, what was the name of the person who came up with the cooperative principle in the front? 
Paul Grice, very good, very good. All right. And my last question is, what was you, the name? You have to, you have to sub-vocalize the answers, oh, actually. Yeah. So. Thank you. That, that prototype was a bit ugly, but that's the early days. Um, OK, last question. What was the name of the restaurant that I was trying to get business hours from? Yeah, another person in the front. Sushi Koo, my favorite Friday night sushi place. All right, thank you. Is that all? Wow. <laughs> good, thank you, Kathy.